everyone. We're going to be starting in a few minutes. Uh, please feel free to introduce each other to each other. You can chat to one another. Let them know who you are, why you're here, and we'll start in just a couple minutes. Okay, so welcome everybody. We're so excited to have all of you here. It's a really nice, diverse group of people, uh, practitioners like ophthalmologists, optometrists, neurologists, as well as patients and caregivers alike. Um, we are so happy to have all of you here. My name is Barak Kassar. I am a partner with BKW Health, which is a, a communications agency for health companies. And our topic today is IIH from a neuro-ophthalmologist's perspective. Our leader today is Dr. Rudrani Banik. She's a board certified ophthalmologist and she is fellowship trained in neuro-ophthalmology. She specializes in addition in an integrative approach to eye disease. She's an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, an educator and researcher, and it also serves as a principal investigator on several cutting edge clinical trials in ophthalmology using gene therapy and nanotechnology. With more than 20 years experience, Dr. Bonick focuses on eye healthy nutrition and lifestyle strategies to protect and preserve vision. Um, she's been a Top doctor in New York Magazine for many years, every year since 2017, is frequently interviewed on in the media on eye health, such as, on places like Good Morning America, New York Times, CBS, ABC, NBC, and Fox, and on many, many podcasts. So we're so happy to have you here. Uh, our moderator is Dr. Srikant Bodu. Dr. Bodu is an experienced interventional, interventional neuroradiologist at Wild Cornell. Uh, medicine's, medicine Brain and Spine Center. His areas of clinical expertise include acute stroke, treatment of cerebrovascular disorders such as aneurysms, AVMs, fistula, keratoid stenosis, tumor, and embolization, and intra-arterial chemotherapy. Dr. Bodu also specializes in venous sinus sensing for pseudotumor cerebri, IIH, and venous pulsatiltinitis. Um, Dr. Bodu's research has been published in many peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery and the American Journal of Neuroradiology. We are thrilled to have you here as well. And let's get started. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to the IIH Hub for inviting me to speak today. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite topics because I see quite a few patients with this condition um, on a regular basis. And I'm based in New York. Uh, in New York City and in our hospital, we have a very large um, uh, referral base. We see about three to five new cases of IIH per week. So we are a really, um, uh, you know, <laughs> inundated with these patients and, you know, from the mildest case to the most severe case. So I'm going to be sharing um, a lot of a, um, a neuro-ophthalmic perspective on IIH with you because I think it is really, really important to understand what's going on in terms of the vision for these patients and also the management uh, based on their visual uh, findings as well as their symptoms. So with that, um, I'm gonna share my screen and let's see here, hopefully. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, so let's, so what I would like to do is begin with the case presentation and then we will, um, uh, talk about IIH, and then we'll come back to the case presentation again at the end. So this is a 34-year-old woman. Um, she's had long-standing migraine. However, her migraines have been relatively fairly controlled over the past few years, but over the past few months, she's had worsening headaches. She also describes pulse synchronous tinnitus. This has been going on for six weeks. Uh, she denies any other visual changes. She denies any transient visual obscurations, which are basically a few seconds of vision loss, usually induced by postural changes, where the vision may go gray or dark. Um, she denies uh, also any peripheral vision loss. She denies any double vision. She has noted a 24-pound weight gain over the past six months, and here she is here. So, um, so on exam, of course, we do a full exam, but I'm just showing you her fundus findings here. 
Um, she has bilateral disc edema. And given her demographics, her history, um, this is highly suspicious for papilla edema from raised intracranial pressure. Now, I do want to just say that there are many other causes of optic disc edema that are not papilla edema. Um, and, you know, depending on what the history is and the workup, we can um, distinguish between different causes of disc edema. But this, again, is highly suspicious for papilla edema from raised intracranial pressure. So, um, so of course, in this patient, we're worried about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And now I'll go into some of the background on IIH and the, the um, again, the neuroplamic perspective on IIH. And then again, we'll come back to the case at the end of the talk and what how she was managed. So IIH has been described, um, you know, dating back to the 1890s. Uh, Quinky first described it as serous meningitis. Um, it was uh, not considered to be an infectious cause, but uh, it was termed meningitis. The term pseudotumor cerebri was initially coined in 1914 by Warrington. And as you can see, over the years, there have been many other terms used to describe this condition. Pseudoabscess, again, even though it's not an infectious cause, otitic hydrocephalus because of the tinnitus that many people experience, hypertensive meningeal hydrops, even though it's not necessarily related to um, hydrops. Um, it was uh, related to raised intracranial pressure, brain swelling of unknown origin, papilledema of indeterminate origin. So this is when papilledema was first introduced into the terminology. Um, and then in 1955, the term benign intracranial hypertension was introduced. Um, that has since fallen out of favor because we know that this condition is not benign. So it's not a term that we use anymore, but sometimes you may see in, in charts or even in older textbooks, this condition is termed BIH. And then um, IIH was then introduced by Corbett and Thompson, um, and that's really the term that stuck. Uh, what I do want to just also point out is that there are two categories of um, what we call pseudotumor cerebri. And so there's primary, which is IIH, and in this, in this category, the exact cause of the raised intracranial pressure has not been determined. Then there's secondary intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri syndrome. So again, pseudotumor cerebri is now used as the umbrella term with IIH being the idiopathic uh, branch with again, no identifiable cause and then pseudotumor cerebri syndrome. And I'll give you some examples of what other causes of raised intracranial pressure can be and what other causes of um, pseudotumor cerebri syndrome may be. So let's now really focus in on the first, the primary um, pseudotumor, which is IIH. So we know that this condition is most commonly seen in women in their childbearing years. The incidence is about one per 100,000 in the general population. But if you look specifically at the population of obese women in their childbearing years, that number jumps up to 19 to 22.5. Now, these numbers were from studies at least 20 years old. So perhaps these numbers have changed. The study has not been repeated. But we do know that in this particular demographic, relatively young women who may be overweight or obese, this condition is fairly common. Um, and it's also quite interesting that, um, sorry, I'm just going to move something here on the screen. 90% um, of these patients are women. There are um, uh, There is a much smaller cohort that are male. Um, and then in terms of the age demographic, usually these women are between the ages of, I would say, 18 to 50 or 55. However, there are cases where children can get IIH. There can be pediatric IIH. And then older individuals can also get IIH. So um, we do see this sometimes in people who are in their 60s, 70s, though it is extremely rare. Um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, 90% of these patients are obese, but not everyone is. And in those patients who are not overweight, um, let's say their normal body mass index, or they may be underweight, we really do have to look for other causes of why their intracranial pressure may be raised. Um, so let's, sorry. Okay, so uh, just uh, for, for those of you who may be joining who may have IIH or, or caregivers for IIH uh, patients, um, I just wanted to point out the definition of obesity here. So uh, obesity, we typically use the body mass index as a score for obesity, and it's calculated by um, weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. So that's the calculation. There's a great website you can go to. Um, and uh, HLBI to do uh, just plug in your numbers if you're wondering what your BMI, BMI may be. It's a simple calculation you can do through an online calculator. So um, normal body mass index or normal weight is between 18.5 
to 24.9 um, kilograms per meter squared. Overweight would be 25 to 29.9. Obese is 30 to 34.9. And morbidly obese is considered 35 and above. So, um, so most of our patients are, again, uh, they most of them have a BMI of 25 or above um, in whom we, we diagnose IIH. So just thinking about you know, what's going on in terms of obesity, especially in the United States, um, there has been really a drastic rise in the prevalence of obesity. And if you look at, it's really interesting, if you look back to CDC data that tracks obesity levels per state, the, the numbers have skyrocketed. And currently, as of the last census, it was estimated that 41.9% of the U.S. adult population is considered obese, meaning BMI over 30, which is really staggering to think of. And the reason I point this out is because obesity is increasing at this rate, IIH has also been increasing in prevalence. Again, we don't have a great recent population study to show us exactly what the numbers are, but we, we definitely have seen this. And, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you in the practices, in my colleagues' practices, the numbers of IIH patients coming in have skyrocketed. So this, uh, this is just one of those CDC maps I wanted to show you. So this is color coded to show uh, by state, states that are reporting their obesity prevalence. You can see that the majority of states are in the orange, light orange, darker orange, and some are even red or um, uh, deeper red. So, uh, and then the, the lower, uh, the yellow, it represents um, uh, basically um, uh, people who are overweight, not obese, but overweight. So you can see that the majority of states are in this category in terms of their uh, prevalence um, of obesity. So again, uh, rising obesity, rising IIH. So let's talk about diagnosis. What are the criteria to diagnose IIH? Well, initially, um, the criteria were called the Dandy criteria. And these criteria were introduced by a neurosurgeon, uh, Walter Dandy. And since then though, there have been um, uh, developments in our understanding of IIH. So these cri the original criteria had to be modified and then they were modified once more. So the modified criteria included four um, uh, points. One, uh, signs and symptoms of high intracranial pressure. Two, no intracranial mass lesion or hydrocephalus. Three, no focal neurologic signs. And then four, normal CSF fluid contents. And we'll talk about CSF in just a few moments. So these were, again, the modified Dandy criteria. However, now that we have uh, more sophisticated imaging technologies, particularly MRV, we've been able to identify other potential causes of IIH and or raised intracranial pressure. And so these, uh, the modified Dandy criteria had to be modified once more. So they're updated criteria. You can call them the modified, modified Dandy criteria. So what are some possible other causes that may relate to the venous sinuses? Um, and I'm sure some of you are very familiar with this if you're um, if this is your area of expertise, but I'll just give you this example here. This is um, a gentleman I saw when I first started practicing over 20 years ago. He was in his mid-30s, uh, mildly overweight, but not obese. He had horrific headaches that came on all of a sudden. He um, had very severe papilledema, and we'll exp I'll explain in just a few minutes what papilledema is, but this was his MRV, and you can see that um, he has, um, I don't know if my pointer is working. Um, could you tell me if my pointer is working here? All right, great. So um, again, I can't use the cursor, but um, basically on the left-hand image, um, we see that one transverse sinus is hypoplastic. Um, the left uh, transverse sinus is hypoplastic. And then on the right side, there's an area of focal stenosis, uh, really severe stenosis. And we can see that also on the sagittal image on the right-hand side of the screen. So this individual, again, 35-year-old male, a little atypical because he was male. He wasn't really, it was mildly overweight, but not obese. He had um, raised intracranial pressure due to this venous sinus abnormality. Now, there's an, this is another case in which the venous sinuses definitely played a role. This is a young woman. Um, she was in her mid-20s. Uh, she was on oral contraceptive. She was also a smoker and she developed sudden severe headaches and she developed this bruising above her eyelid. And it turned out that um, she actually had um, extensive uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis involving the superior ophthalmic vein as well. And so uh, this was the cause of her, of her it wasn't IIH, it was pseudotumor cerebri syndrome. 
um, from this uh, clot that she developed. Again, she did have some risk factors of being on oral contraceptives and also smoking. So these are some more rare cases, but I just wanted to point these out to you because now we can identify some of these other causes of raised intracranial pressure, which would again fall into the pseudotumor cerebri syndrome category, the secondary causes of raised intracranial pressure category. So, um, so now these are the updated criteria for IIH that we use. These were actually introduced by my colleagues, um, Deb Friedman and Dan Jacobson, uh, who are also neuro-ophthalmologists, was published in neurology. So the updated criteria are symptoms or signs reflecting um, generalized intracranial hypertension or papilledema now, or is the key uh, word here, and, and I'll explain why, but or symptoms or signs. Number two, documented elevated intracranial pressure. Number three, normal CSF composition. Number four, no other identifiable cause of intracranial hypertension. And number five, no hydrocephalus mass structural or vascular lesion that may be responsible for raised intracranial pressure. So let's talk about symptoms and signs of IIH. Again, these are the part of the criteria. So what are the common symptoms? Well, um, a study by, again, another one of my colleagues who's also a neuro-ophthalmologist, Michael Wall from Iowa, he did this study published in 1991 where he um, polled people with uh, IIH and headache was by far the number one presenting symptom, followed by transient visual obscurations. Again, these are two or three seconds of vision loss that people may experience that are postural. Uh, actual vision loss, 7%, diplopia meaning double vision, 7%. And interestingly, 4% of these patients had no symptoms whatsoever when they first came in. Um, now, uh, in the same year, another interesting study was, was published. This was by Giuseppe and his colleagues, again, looking at IIH symptoms, and he found a relatively similar profile in terms of symptomatology, headaches, transient visual obscurations. Now, this was an interesting one, the tinnitus, which is a very unique type of tinnitus um, in which people hear uh, a, a sound that sounds like their heart beating in their ear, almost like water, or there's turbulence of, of fluid, like a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh type of sound, again, with their heartbeat. And some people experience this when they're lying down. It may be positional. Others, they may experience it all day long. But this is a very unique feature of IIH that was described first in this paper in 1991. Um, photopsias can also occur in these patients. Photopsias are basically tiny little flashes of light. Many people do have photopsias, but in these IH patients, it tends to be more prevalent. And also eye pain, um, eye pain or eye socket pain, like a dull ache in the eye socket were also symptoms. Now, um, the same investigators, they, they did in their study, they actually did something interesting. They took IIH cases and compared them to controls in terms of symptoms. And it turned out that a lot of the controls who did not have IIH also had similar symptoms. So this is really interesting. Many people, you can see the cases were uh, are here in the deep red and the controls were in the black. Um, headache was very common in both groups. Uh, transient visual obscurations, photopsia is more common in the controls. But the one key feature that had the most um, uh, difference uh, between cases and controls was this tinnitus. So now it's it's really commonplace that this is one of the very first questions we ask our patients. Do you hear anything in your ears? Do you hear a swishing sound in your ears? If so, if we see the disc edema, we're much more likely to think IIH rather than something else. So, um, so that is, again, a really important um, symptom that was elucidated from that study. Now, another uh, symptom, it's not as common as, um, as it may seem in the textbooks, but another common symptom is double vision from a six nerve palsy. So these, this is one of the nerves that goes from the brain to the eye socket. It helps control uh, one of the muscles in the eyes and from high pressure in the brain, that nerve may not be working properly. And therefore uh, that muscle doesn't work properly and it can cause someone's eyes to suddenly cross in. So they may have been seeing straight, but all of a sudden their vision may um, be doubled because one of their eyes is crossed in, or maybe both of their eyes are crossed in, depending if it's a unilateral or bilateral lateral six nerve palsy. Now, keep in mind that this symptom of double vision is not unique to IIH, and it's also not unique to high pressure in the brain. There are other things that can also cause high pressure in the brain or, or other brain issues that um, may cause a six nerve palsy or bilateral six nerve palsy. So we talked about the symptoms. Now let's talk about the signs of IIH. Again, still talking about the diagnostic criteria. So those were the symptoms patients may have. Now, what are the clinical findings we see as, as neuro-ophthalmologists that we look for on the eye exam? Well, first of all, we look for 
various mechanisms of vision loss. And of course, the most commonly seen one is papilledema. And why do people develop papilledema with raised intracranial pressure? Let me give you just a very brief explanation. So first of all, the eye is a direct extension of the brain. And the eye is connected to the brain via the optic nerve, which basically serves like a cable connecting the eye to the brain. And, um, and within the optic nerve, there are 1.2 million axons, nerve axons in the optic nerve. So think of it like uh, wires going, uh, you know, bound together as a cable. And then there's a sheath around that cable. So there's a covering around that cable, which is called the optic nerve sheath. Now, normally there is fluid inside that sheath. It's cerebrospinal fluid, the same fluid that surrounds our brain and our spinal cord is found within that sheath around the optic nerve. But when the pressure goes goes up, that fluid pressure rises, it pushes, puts pressure on the optic nerve, puts pressure on those axons, and basically the axons swell and they get um, distended. There's axoplasmic flow stasis. And that's why we develop, that's why patients develop papilledema with raised intracranial pressure, because there's increased pressure within the optic nerve sheet that's compressing the nerve and causing this. So this, um, the diagram on the right-hand side is a cross-section. It's a schematic, a cross-section of the optic nerve head. So on uh, the top one, A, you can see that the fibers, I'm sorry, my pointer is not working, but um, the, the fibers are very loosely organized. But in B, which represents raised intracranial pressure, there is um, increased pressure within the sheath. And then the fibers, the axons get straightened out. They, they're um, uh, very uh, tight. And then uh, that swelling gets transmitted to the optic nerve head and it, it presents as papilledema. So basically the schematic on the right is um, showing you what's happening when we look in the back of the eye and we see the swelling of the optic nerve. And that's the reason why from pressure from behind. Now, um, sorry, this picture is a little bit um, blurry, but uh, I just wanted to show you what a normal optic nerve looks like and what a nerve with papilledema looks like. So on the left, this is a normal optic nerve. It's a circular structure. Uh, usually it's very be beautiful orange in color, meaning that it's very vascularized. And then the center part is usually a yellowish white color. That's called the optic cup. And that's normal. That's basically um, where the vessels come out from, from the center cup. And you can see that on the picture on the left, the nerve, the borders look very clear. It's, it's again, it's a little blurry picture, but the borders are relatively clear. They're well-defined. The vessels look normal. On the right is a case of papilledema where the nerve is extremely swollen. You can see all the congestion of the optic nerve head. You can even see some hemorrhages. The vessels look very tortuous. They look very engorged. So it, it's representing the pressure from behind, pushing everything forward. Um, now, I wanted to just briefly touch upon the grading scale that we use for papilledema. And this is something that we use clinically in our practices. And we use this also to help um, uh, monitor patients. Um, if they've been diagnosed, we monitor them as they're being treated to see how they're responding because this is a, an indirect correlate of what their intracranial pressure may be doing. So this Friesen papilledema grading scale is a scale from zero to five. And I showed you what a normal optic nerve looks like. In grade zero, basically there may be a little bit of elevation of the optic nerve border, but it's not fully swollen. So in this diet, in this picture right here, you can see that the majority of the nerve, the borders are very sharp, but down below, right at the inferior aspect of the nerve, there's a little bit of haziness. So that's actually swelling from raised intracranial pressure in this patient. And that is a grade zero papilledema optic nerve. And so it may on first glance look normal, but if you look really closely, you will see that the nerve is um, focal swollen. Now we actually use other imaging uh, diagnostic technologies also to grade papilledema. We do objective measurements of papilledema. We use a, a um, machine called an OCT, optical coherence tomography. And I'm not going to get into the technical details of it, but basically it's a non-invasive scan of the optic nerve head. And it provides us with a color-coded report of whether the nerve is normal, whether it's been damaged or thinned, or whether it's swollen. And um, we can actually measure the amount of papilledema um, and someone's response to treatment. We can monitor that using OCT as well. Um, normal, I don't, sorry, I don't have a picture of an OCT here to show you, but normal OCT measurements is, are anywhere from 80 to 120 microns. 
So many patients with papilledema may have slightly higher than that. They may have, you know, 125, 130, that's mild, but some people have OCT measurements that are in the hundreds, 200, 300, 400, even 500 microns of swelling that can develop from raised intracranial pressure. Um, so now moving on to grade one papilledema, again, this is the Friesen grading scale. So here, um, basically now you can really start to see the swelling of the nerve. You see this kind of halo around the nerve and it looks kind of um, blurred, uh, whitish uh, in color. And so in grade one papilledema, that swelling goes around, um, but it spares the temporal aspect of the optic nerve head. So it's not a 360 degree swelling, it's 270 degrees of swelling of the optic nerve head. Um, so you can see these are all various different um, uh, patients with grade one papilledema. Um, on the bottom right picture, you can see the vessels are extremely tortuous. This is something we see as well, where it's not just the optic nerve head that has these changes, the blood vessels also start to look engorged and congested. Now in grade two papilledema, that swelling goes all the way around. So now the swelling is 360 degrees. But the key here is that the blood vessels are still identifiable. Um, we can still follow the blood vessels out as they're leaving from the center of the optic nerve all the way to the retina. So these are two examples of grade two papilledema. Now in grade three papilledema, what you're seeing here is a swelling. It just looks more angry. It looks more um, congested. But in grade three papilledema, some of the vessels as they leave the optic disc margin begin to be obscured. So basically there's so much edema that the vessels are no longer clearly defined. So this is a grade three, these three pictures are grade three papilledema. Now you may ask, you know, what is that on the bottom right-hand corner? Why does it look white? You know, what are those white kind of fluffy cotton looking um, uh, areas? So those are actually called cotton wool spots and those represent ischemia. So um, cotton wool spots can happen at any stage, even in grade one papilledema, you can get cotton wool spots, but basically it's ischemia of some of the nerve fibers as they're um, usually around the optic nerve or on the surface of the optic nerve. We can also see hemorrhages, um, which I think I've shown you in some of the previous pictures that can also happen in any grade of papilledema from one to five, usually not in grade zero, but one to five can have hemorrhages and or cotton wool spots. Now grade four papilledema, you can see it's looking angrier and angrier. So in grade four papilledema, we um, uh, have a hard time distinguishing the, blood, the major blood vessels as they're leaving the surface of the optic nerve. So all of these are grade four papilledema. You can see um, there's differences in the exposure of the, of, the, of the images, but the one on the bottom right looks very vascular. You see there's a lot of um, telangiectasia on the surface of the nerve head, again, really implying that there's so much pressure from behind in the CSF space that all of those capillaries are engorged and dilated, and they also leak. Um, they're very leaky um, when they get to the stage. But this is grade four papilledema. And then grade five papilledema is really when the nerve just looks like um, completely swollen where we really can't make out any landmarks on the surface of the optic nerve. So there's really partial or total obscuration of all vessels on the surface of the optic nerve. Now, if you read in the textbooks, grade five papilledema is usually described as a champagne cork appearance. Now, why do they call it a champagne cork? Well, I would think that it's probably because if you did a cross section of this, you have the nerve coming from behind within the dural sheath. And then when it gets to the uh, into the eye, it basically explodes like a mushroom because there's so much swelling and pressure from behind. So on cross section, you could call it a champagne cork appearance. But when we actually look on our fundoscopy, we don't see the champagne cork. All we see is the surface, you know, a two-dimensional picture basically on the surface of the optic nerve. So um, there's also one other stage of papilledema I did want to point out. It's not part of the Friesen grading scheme, but this is atrophic papilledema. And in this case, what's happened is that the papilledema has been going on for so long that the nerve has been damaged and basically the fibers begin to die. And once this happens, once the fibers begin to die off, the axons um, die, that's irreversible. And usually atrophic papilledema is associated with severe vision loss and or even legal blindness. 
Um, and this is basically an indicator. This has been going on a very, very long time. The nerve axons have been permanently damaged. And fortunately, there's only a really small percentage of our patients who come in in this stage. The majority of our patients who come in with IIH come in at a much earlier stage of papilledema. So it's good that we have time to intervene and start their treatment. But once you get to this stage, it really is a medical emergency. And oftentimes these patients end up needing surgery even if it's heroic rescue surgery, some of them do need surgery just to see if we can try to regain any of their vision that they've lost. Um, the other thing you can see here is that the nerve doesn't look that elevated anymore. It's actually quite flat um, when it gets to this stage. And um, that kind of whitish uh, material you're seeing around the nerve, that's actually what we call gliosis. So that's um, an indicator that there used to be severe papilledema before, the swelling has resolved because the nerve axons have died off, but what's left is this gliotic material and it almost looks like, um, like a veil, kind of like a very thin, fine veil over the optic nerve head. The vessels also become very thin and attenuated in atrophic papilledema. So um, getting back to the criteria for IIH. So based on these updated my modified dandy criteria, remember I said that th there could be symptoms or signs of uh, raised intracranial pressure. So it is possible for some people to come in with symptoms, but they do not have papilledema on their exam. So this is fairly rare um, that someone would not have papilledema with IIH. Um, perhaps it has something to do with their anatomy in the optic nerve sheath, their trabeculations within the optic nerve sheath. They may prohibit the nerve from getting swollen. So um, we don't exactly know why some people don't have papilledema. Uh, but this is uh, compromising, I would say, less than 5% of our patients with IIH who do not present with papilledema. Now, if we're worried about IIH, sometimes we really absolutely do need to document that the pressure is raised because they don't have papilledema. Um, so uh, definitely an LP is indicated, sometimes even multiple LPs. And also keep in mind that if the, if the patient has had symptoms for a long time and they have not been diagnosed and they're in the atrophic stage of papilledema, once those nerve axons begin to die off, that nerve may not have the capacity to swell anymore. So that may be another reason why we don't see swelling in some cases of advanced papilledema or atrophic papilledema, because there's really nothing left to swell because those nerve axons have, have, um, have died. So um, uh, other symptoms we look at, we look at vision uh, in terms of visual field. And these are just, um, just, uh, just to show you the types of visual field loss that can be seen in IIH. Now, you know, here underneath it's listed grade one, grade two, grade three. This actually does not necessarily correlate with the Friesen grading scale for papilledema. So someone can have um, a Friesen a scale five, very advanced papilledema and only have mild vision loss. So it doesn't necessarily predict what the, the grade of papilledema does not necessarily predict what the visual field would look like, but this is a typical pattern of visual field loss with papilledema from IIH. Usually there's a, the grade, um, the picture on the left, the, the top left, um, there's an increased blind spot. And sometimes we start to see some peripheral loss. Grade two, there's um, more peripheral loss and then grade three, more and more. So basically what happens is with IIH, the visual field begins to constrict. And in the most advanced cases of IIH, what happens is there's constriction of the visual field to the point where people only see in the center. So basically, they're, it's like tunnel vision. They have lost all of their peripheral vision. And what I wanted to point out about this is that, first of all, this does not happen overnight. This takes usually years to develop. Um, many people go undiagnosed before they get to the advanced stages of visual field loss. But um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that in, in stages one, two, and three, when it's mild field loss or more peripheral, many people don't even realize that they have loss of their peripheral vision because they have learned to, their brain acclimates to it. So they learn how to perhaps use the other eye more uh, for their peripheral vision. So many people don't know. So that's why it's important to do an actual visual field test. So in our offices, we do what's called a Humphrey visual field test. There are other machines as well that can do visual field testing. And what we're looking for, um, at least in the earliest stages of papilledema, are again, increased blind spot and some peripheral changes. This is the prototypical field defect that we usually see with IIH, we see this inferior loss. Again, I'm sorry, my pointer is not working here, but um, it's on the bottom corner there. So that, that 
oval is the blind spot. And then on the left, that kind of like small dark area is what we call an inferior nasal step. And these um, machines that on which we do our visual field testing, they are very advanced. They can give us really very fine, um, precise data in terms of how is the patient doing objective data. So yes, we have the subjective symptoms. Uh, we have uh, the objective data of the papilledemus grade and then the OCT, but this also gives us um, a subjective, um, it's the subjective test, but it gives us subjective data in terms of quantifying how much visual field loss does this patient have. And we actually look at all the numbers. So if you ever look at a printout of the visual field, it's actually quite complex. And I'll show you a couple of them, um, but there's a lot of information there. We actually look at the numbers. So um, uh, moving on, there are other causes of potential vision loss in IIH. Sometimes the nerve is so swollen that fluid tracks from the nerve into the macula, which is the center of our vision. That's the area that helps us to see 20-20 vision. So fluid can track underneath the retina, and that's what we're seeing in these diagrams. Again, I'm sorry, my pointer is not working here. Um, so we, we do uh, OCTs, we do um, other tests to see exactly why does the patient have vision loss. And these are some things that we see. Sometimes there are folds in the retina and the picture on the right corner, uh, right bottom corner shows you that you could see some like radial folds, lines. Sometimes they're circumlinear, we call those patterns lines. So these are all findings that we can see on the eye exam in IIH. So just to sum up here in terms of symptoms or signs, so the diagnosis of IIH can still be made if the patient is completely asymptomatic, but they have papilledema. And in fact, many of our patients we see in our clinic um, are sent by local optometrists or ophthalmologists, people who just went for a regular eye exam. They just went to get their glasses updated. And the doctor saw, oh my goodness, the nerve is swollen and the patient was referred over and they had no symptoms whatsoever. So they're completely asymptomatic, but they had incidental optic nerve edema on exam. And then we do the workup and in many cases it ends up being IIH. So that's one scenario. But the other scenario can also happen where again, the patient is symptomatic, but they do not have papilledema on their exam. Um, and uh, also as part of the criteria, the updated criteria, no other cause of intracranial hypertension should be identified. And there is a very long list. This is not even the complete list, but we look for, or we ask about all of these conditions. We ask about medications. Or have they taken recent antibiotics? Are they on a vitamin A derivative for acne? Uh, do they take vitamin A supplements? Have they recently been on steroids? Could there be steroid withdrawal? Are they on any kind of um, psychotherapeutic agent like lithium can cause raised intracranial pressure. Growth hormone can cause inter increased intracranial pressure. And then there's some medical conditions as well. And the two I'll point out uh, that I think are the most important to really rule out include sleep apnea. Sleep apnea can be associated with raised intracranial pressure, IIH, or actually it would be not IIH, but pseudotumor cerebri syndrome. And also iron deficiency anemia can also be associated with uh, raised intracranial pressure. So uh, then the final criteria is the neuroimaging. So we need to make sure that there's no hydrocephalus, mass, structural, vascular lesions. So what type of imaging is really best? Well, ideally, we like to get MRIs of the brain with and without contrast. If MRI is not readily available, let's say, um, you know, uh, the machine is down or, you know, some patient is in a rural, rural area, they don't have access to an MRI right away, at least get a CT and preferably a contrast enhanced CT if the patient is atypical. If they're younger, if they're older, if they're male, if they're not overweight, if they're not obese, get that contrast enhanced CT. And then um, also for atypical patients, we do routinely do MRVs. And we've actually been moving towards doing MRVs on just about everyone with IIH, because we do wanna know what their venous anatomy looks like. Um, and you know can help guide us in certain in some cases. So um, now, uh, what about um, moving on to diagnosis um, through LP? So um, what is the ideal way the LP should be done, and what are the numbers that we look for? Well, first of all, uh, the patient should be in the lateral decubitus position, and this image here is not correct. Actually, the leg should be extended because when somebody kind of rolls into a fetal position, um, they and their legs are or are, are the knees are flexed up to their chest, their abdominal pressure may rise that may falsely elevate their vena cable pressure may falsely elevate their intracranial pressure. So we prefer the legs extended in a lateral decubitus position. And um, in terms of numbers, um, adults for adults who are of normal 
body habitus, meaning normal BMI. Um, their opening pressure would have to be above 200 millimeters of water or centimeters of water uh, or 20 centimeters of water for it to be considered high. If an individual is obese, then that, um, that uh, threshold rises to 25 or 250 millimeters of water. Um, now keep in mind that the CSF pressure fluctuates just like blood pressure fluctuates, just like eye pressure fluctuates. Um, so you're just getting a, a single measurement in one, you know, one time point. And you know, if it's relatively on the low side, like for example, I had a patient last week, um, she had the demographics of IIH, she had the symptoms, she had the disc edema. However, her opening pressure was 20 um, and her BMI was over 30. So despite that, you know, we still would treat for, I, we would still diagnose IIH, even though she didn't meet that 25 criteria. So you really do have to take it on an individual basis. Sometimes repeat measurements may be necessary, but it's not something I typically recommend because this procedure is not the most comfortable for patients. It can be quite uncomfortable. And also we don't wanna keep um, putting a needle into the epidural space. Um, so for patients who are, who are obese, it really is best to do the lumbar puncture under fluoroscopy. So fluoroscopic guided LP. Um, and um, sometimes the patient is positioned in the prone position, but we do ask that they be turned to their lateral decubitus position before the uh, manometer is, um, is um, uh, uh, used to check their opening pressure. Um, so now um, I just want to pause for a moment because I think I've talked for about 45 minutes or maybe 40 minutes. I let I just want to open it up to any questions along the way because again, I can't control my my mouse. So I can't even see the chat. I, I'm not sure what's going on with my computer today. But um, so if you could, if anyone has questions, feel free to maybe ask, unmute yourself, or would Dr. Bodu like to? Yes. Um... Dr. Benning, thank you for the talk. It's uh, really great so far. I know it is a, I can say I learned uh, from the talk, especially the grading of the papilledema more. We know theoretical, but pictures wise, it is great here. We have a few questions. Um, in terms of the, um, one of the thing is, will you use the uh, Fisher grading to decide um, at what stage patient can go for the treatment or, like no. a great, great, excellent. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm going to actually talk about that in the treatment section. But um, so the the pap, the Friesen grading scale is it's really interesting. It's it's a sign, but it does not um, it does not have any um, significance in terms of pro the prognosis. It can't prognosticate you know, who, which treatment is best for which patient. For example, again, someone may have the most severe grade of papilledema. They may have a, a grade five, but their symptoms are minimal and their visual field looks great. And in that, in that case, we don't necessarily have to just treat what we see as papilledema. We treat the patient and um, it doesn't really guide us, but it is a way for us to monitor how they're doing as a, a non-invasive way to monitor, monitor their intracranial pressure. Thank you. I mean, that's how I, I have a busy venous practice, a venous stenting practice as well. So that is, I use the papilledema grade as a, uh, a prognostic and uh, how to monitor them post stent improvements. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing you mentioned about the uh, category of atrophic, uh, atrophic papilledema. So does it mean to reach that stage, um, patient has to go through the grade five and then atrophic papilledema, or if the patient stays on a long time for grade three or grade four, they can develop, still develop the atrophic changes? Yeah, that is a great question. And so the answer is that if the papilledema has been present for long enough and the axons are compromised, then they may develop into an atrophic state. So they don't necessarily have to go through all five stages and then become atrophic. So let's say someone's a grade three and it's been chronic and you know either they have not been diagnosed or they have fulminant IIH, but they never get beyond a grade three, they can still go atrophic. So it, yes, it can happen even with lower grades of papilledema. I think the key here is chronicity. The longer it's been there untreated or undertreated, the more likely they are to develop atrophic. And luckily most patients don't, the vast majority never get to that um, end stage of papilledema. And uh, on the same lines, just an extension of that question. So if the patient waited for a longer time on a grade two or grade three or more chronic patient, 
and we end up treating the patient, either shunt or a stent, the recovery in that patient is this also delayed recovery in terms of the returning back or, or it is the same as uh, the speed of recovery is normal as a chronic patient and also or this uh, patient whom we treat at an early stage. Yeah, no, another great question. So um, the answer really depends on, even though they've been chronic, it depends on uh, when they presented where they are in terms of their visual field loss and also their OCTs. So if they have very severe visual field loss and then they get a procedure done, that visual field loss may not be reversible. So it depends on actual, you know, the number, well, the visual field doesn't quantify the number of axons that have been lost. The OCT can help quantify that. So we can see on the OCT, if they have loss, which we call RNFL loss, retinal nerve fiber layer loss, then they're much less likely to recover after having a procedure done. Um, it depends on how they start off. So if they start out with healthy, yes, they have papilledema, they have an advanced stage of papilledema, but if their field looks great, their um, OCTs look great, most likely they're going to recover full vision. They won't have any sequelae. But if they come in and already in a damaged state, then it's unlikely to completely reverse. And so, I mean, that is uh, very helpful because at least we can say in terms of the patient expectations post-treatment, those patients we are saying to prevent further worsening, we are the treat, doing the treatment. Then Absolutely. And then there's the headache component as well. Yes. You know, there's, I'm talking about the vision component, but then there's the headache component as well. So the, the treatment may significantly improve their headaches. So, um, and it is, I know you, you have to talk about the treatment. Um, there are a couple of questions on treatment, but uh, tinnitus wise, have you seen, I mean, at least I will, my experience is this is a spectrum uh, of a tinnitus and the headaches, but have you seen a patient uh, with isolated tinnitus without papilledema still as an IAH situation? Absolutely, yes. And it could be in those situations, it could be that their intracranial pressure rises intermittently. And so they're having spikes in their pressure. And when they have the spikes, they have the sound in their ears. And I oftentimes hear from patients, it's not all the time. You know, if I have a salty meal, all of a sudden I'll start hearing the tinnitus. Or if I gain a few pounds, I'll hear it. But we look on their exam, they may not actually develop papilledema. So um, it can happen where um, it's the only symptom. And I do have some patients who go into remission with IIH. They've been treated, they've lost weight, they've you know, taken medications, they're doing well, their papilledema resolves. But then all of a sudden the tinnitus comes back and then they have a recurrence. So it could be a good way for patients themselves to monitor what their intracranial pressure may be doing. That's what I was getting at, uh, because it is the, like you said, the most of the, uh, or at least some of the patients, when they go for eye checkup, they suddenly see the swelling and they come. But probably direct eye evaluation may not be the uh, first line of screening for these patients. Even patients who has the tinnitus, maybe they should be evaluated by neuro-ophthalmology, at least to see if it is there or not there, if it is there, what grade it is. Absolutely. You... I agree. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, or at least by, you know, if they can't get in to see a neuro ophthalmologist, I know sometimes some of, um, you know, we, we sometimes have long wait times to get in to see us. Um, at least by uh, a qualified eye care professional, either an ophthalmologist or optometrist, so they can do a dilated fundus exam and look for papilledema. Okay. Um, I think it's our next questions are more related to the treatment. So we want to hear the, your treatment thing and then take Sure, some. okay, great. So um, so I like to think about this, um, the treatment divided into medical um, interventions and surgical interventions. So we'll talk about medical first and then I'll touch upon surgical um, depending on how much time we have left. So in terms of medical treatments, from a neuro-ophthalmic perspective, we decide our treatment decisions based on, as I was saying earlier, the degree and the progression of visual field loss. So how likely are they to go downhill with respect to their visual function? And then number two, the control of their headache. So those are the two things that we look for. One is, um, you know, it's a test that we do in the office. The other is the patient's symptoms of headache. Um, and so uh, in terms of medical treatment, now these are 
uh, some of the um, uh, approaches that have been used that have proven very successful. So first of all, we know that weight reduction, particularly in those who are obese, even those who are over overweight, do benefit from weight reduction, also a low sodium diet. And I'll talk a little bit more about these in detail, but I just wanna go through the list first. Repeat lumbar punctures, which is something we do not recommend on a regular basis anymore, but it used to be done in the past. Medications, then there's a host of medications that can be used. So let's talk about each of these. So how did this concept of weight loss for IAH first come up? Well, it dates back to 1974, where Newberg and her colleagues described nine patients with IIH, uh, back then, again, they used to call it pseudotumor cerebri, and they put them on a low-sodium, fluid-restricted, caloric-restricted diet, and their diet was a rice reduction diet. So they basically ate rice, only rice, really, um, for an extended period of time, and their total caloric intake was 450 calories per day. And what they found was that this significantly, and they were just monitoring only papilledema, this significantly improved their papilledema and as well as their symptoms. So that's where the concept first came. And then in uh, many years later, almost 20 plus 25 years later, Johnson and his colleagues did a study where they, um, they looked at how much weight loss was required and they found that 6% of weight loss was associated with a reduction in papilledema, just 6%. So we'll, uh, you know, we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, and so then um, Alexander Sinclair, she's one of my colleagues from um, England, and I actually just came from a neuro-ophthalmology conference, and, and we had a nice talk, and I'm going to share with you some interesting uh, updates about IIH that she shared with me. But um, basically, she did a study where she had um, 25 IIH patients who were refractory to therapy, so they were already on medication, uh, medical therapy. Um, they, she put them on a low-calorie diet. 425 calories a day of a um, of a nutritionally complete smoothie, basically, uh, several times a day. And she measured their intracranial pressure before and twice during the study. So these patients actually had three lumbar punctures during the course of the study. And she found that the patients lost a tremendous amount of weight, some people 25 pounds or more being on this diet, and their papilledema improved, and their headaches improved, and their CSF pressure decreased by 80 um, millimeters of water, which is really very significant. So um, now uh, what about repeat lumbar punctures? So for, we know that weight loss does work. What about repeat lumbar punctures? Well, we know that the effect is very transient. The CSF turns over. So we, if you do a lumbar puncture, you take out some fluid. Um, uh, within 80 to 90 minutes, the brain remakes that fluid. And so the CSF completely um, turns over at least five times a day. So it's not something that we recommend just to keep control of one's intracranial pressure. And also there have been case reports of repeat lumbar punctures associated with uh, spinal ependymomas, even meningiomas. So it is again, not a treatment that we re recommend uh, for maintenance therapy for IIH. Um, so what about acetazolamide? Well, the first use of acetazolamide, which is the, the trade name is Diamox, uh, which are either pills or capsules, um, Gusser and Virenstein used four grams of Diamox a day in the neurosurgical ICU. This is a very um, interesting study where these patients were given, they had known intracranial, elevated intracranial pressure. They had monitors in, so they could actually monitor what their intracranial pressure was. And they gave them four grams a day and they, sat, they found that immediately after the medication, their intracranial pressure dropped significantly. So that's where the concept of using Diamox was first introduced for raised intracranial pressure. Since then, others have um, done studies um, in 1988. Tom Sack used one gram of Diamox a day and found resolution of papilledema in four patients. What's the mechanism of action? Well, we don't know exactly for sure, but we think that acetazolamide reduces the production of fluid by the brain by anywhere from six to 50%, which isn't great, but it's something. And we think that you probably have to block, you know, uh, 80, 98 to 99 percent of um, carbonic anhydrase um, uh, uh, to achieve a good CSF result. But anyway, uh, this is kind of uh, what the mechanism action was thought was thought for Diamox. And I'll come back to Diamox also in just a moment. Um, what about topiramate, which is Topamax? This is a medication that is FDA approved for um, seizures. It's also FDA approved for headaches and migraines. It also has a mild carbonic anhydrase inhibitor um, mechanism. So it helps to decrease fluid produced by the brain. It controls headaches. And the other fortuitous side effect for many of our IIH patients is that 
It is an appetite suppressant. So it helps with weight loss. So this drug has three benefits, decreased pressure by the fluid produced by the brain. It independently has a headache um, uh, reducing um, action and it helps with weight loss. However, um, especially if you're you know, considering this and you're, you need to counsel patients that there is a very small risk of inducing uh, a type of glaucoma, which is angle closure glaucoma. So uh, luckily it doesn't happen often, but it is something to consider with topiramate or topamax. Um, now, what about topamax versus acetazolamide like head to head? There have been some studies done. And what I'll tell you is that the studies have shown that they're relatively comparable. Um, however, uh, acetazolamide is really our first drug of choice for IIH. And um, other treatments that can be used, uh, for example, if someone can't tolerate Dimox or topiramate, let's say they have had um, you know, some side effects from it and they don't want to take it anymore, another option is Lasix, which is furosemide. And I do use this often in my patients who are pregnant or who are um, trying to become pregnant because there is a small risk um, for uh, birth defects using acetazolamide. So I always counsel my patients, if you're planning to get pregnant, please let me know ahead of time because we need to adjust your medications and maybe swap out medications so that there's no potential risk to your, to your baby. Um, and then finally, steroids, not recommended, but let's say there's a case of fulminant IIH where vision's really going downhill quickly. Sometimes we will admit the patient, put them on IV steroids, solumedrol. Very rarely do we do this anymore. Uh, but in the past, people would be put on oral steroids. The downside of putting them on oral steroids is that um, two things. Well, first of all, it can cause weight gain uh, if used chronically. But the second thing is that when you take the steroids away, um, withdrawal of steroids is also a risk factor for high pressure in the brain. So maybe the pressure may be controlled when the patient's on steroids, but then you take it off, you wean it off, and then the pressure may go up. So that's a concern. So based on all of this, you know, there was really a need for a clinical trial for IIH to really determine what is the best way to treat these patients. Um, a lot of the previous um, reports were very anecdotal, small case series. So we really needed a controlled randomized clinical trial. And so this is where the IIHTT, uh, this is how it was developed. So this was a multi-center, double-blind, randomized clinical trial comparing acetazolamide, which is Dimox, at, to placebo with regards to visual field outcomes. Now, again, this was a study um, that was uh, multi-centered. So there were 38 centers in this study in the US and Canada. Uh, it was part of our neuro-ophthalmology research disease, disease group, which I am a part of. And so I did participate in this study as a clinical investigator. And what we did was we took patients who were early on in their disease. So they had very mild visual field loss, not advanced visual field loss, mild visual field loss. And what we did was we, um, this was a complex diagram here, but we, um, we made sure, first of all, that they qualified. We used the, dan the modified, the updated modified DANDY criteria for IIH. We did visual fields on them. And if they met the criteria, we enrolled them in the study. So uh, what we did was there was one arm, again, a blinded study, double blind placebo control study. One arm got acetazolamide in escalating doses from um, basically uh, 1,000 milligrams a day up to 4,000 milligrams a day. The other arm got placebo. And all the subjects in the study also got instruction on weight loss. They all had individual weight loss coaches. Uh, we gave them exercise regimens and we gave them diets to follow. So this was not just the medical side from uh, a Dimox perspective, but we were also looking at weight loss. So the placebo patients were also instructed in weight loss. So we were comparing whether the medication uh, really was the better option for these patients with mild visual field loss. And we, um, the, um, the, um, the outcome, the primary outcome of the study was their visual field change at six months. So they were treated for six months. And then we did um, a lot of statistical analysis. And we also looked at other things. We looked at papilledema grade. We looked at quality of life scores. We looked at headache. Um, we looked at um, OCT measurements, et cetera. So there was many other components to this trial, but basically these patients were only the mild patients with II, patients with mild vision loss from IIH. And so I was uh, mentioning earlier that there's a lot of information on these visual fields that we look at. So you can see it's really a complex report with lots of numbers, but basically you see where there's uh, an oval pink circle. So we're looking at the MD number. MD stands for mean deviation. And basically mean deviation means how far does the patient's visual field deviate from 
other people the same age and the same sex as they are. So there's a database of hundreds of thousands of people um, that have done this visual field who are quote unquote normal. And so the machine is comparing the patient's outcome to that database, that normative database. And I'll tell you that um, normal visual field numbers for the mean deviation are anywhere from zero to minus two. Then minus two to minus seven is what we consider mild visual field loss. Um, minus seven to let's say minus 10 is more moderate visual field loss and minus 10 and above is more severe visual field loss. Now those are kind of ballpark numbers. So um, the trial only looked at patients who had mild field loss minus two to minus seven decibels on their visual field. Um, now, also as part of the study, this was a really complex study. It was funded by the NIH in the US, um, but we all were also trying to elucidate what is the cause of IIH? So we're looking at um, genetic SNPs. We were doing genetic analysis on these patients. And so we were screening for disease causing mutation SNPs and alleles. And um, also we looked at their blood and their CSF. We looked at vitamin A levels. We looked at other CSF markers of electrolytes. And unfortunately um, the subject, um, the, the, the trial in, um, enrolled 165 subjects. It wasn't enough power to really give us answers to these questions. Um, we do have the data stored in case you know there's ever any need to look at it again. Uh, the samples are stored as well in case it needs to be reanalyzed. But so far, we were not able to find a genetic um, SNP or SNPs that were associated, or we looked at vitamin A levels, all kinds of vitamin A derivatives, metabolites. We could not find anything. We looked at sodium levels, could not find any patterns to why these patients may potentially be having IIH. We also looked at hormone levels. So we looked at um, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, and I believe cortisol, again, did not find um, uh, any uh, linkages. So, uh, so just to really, I, I know we're almost at, we're actually above uh, over time. Uh, maybe I'll just like really quickly finish up with the IIHT and then we can open it up to maybe another few questions. But uh, we had 317 patients were screened, but a lot of them had to be excluded. We had 165 randomized. And basically um, of those 165, 161 were female. So definitely we know this is a female um, uh, you know, um, a disease that affects women much more uh, commonly than men. The average age was 29 with a range of 18 to 53. 88% uh, were obese. And the mean BMI in the study was 39.9. Um, and interestingly, 5% identified other family members also with IIH. So there may be a familial predisposition to this condition. And we also know that of all the patients we screened, um, we had to turn away a lot of patients because maybe their mean deviations didn't qualify, but that mean deviation of minus two to minus seven compromised about, uh, comprised about one third of patients who present with IIH. So um, what were the results? Well, um, the visual field improved modestly, only 0.71 decibels. All of, most patients were treated with azetazolamide, had significant improvement in their papilledema scale, their opening pressure also significantly reduced. Weight loss was seen in both groups. The acetazolamide patients had about 16 pounds of weight loss versus with the placebo group, eight pounds of weight loss. Remember, they were all coached in diet. They all had weight loss coaches. Um, their quality of life measures improved and their visual function scores improved as well. So um, oh, I'm not sure what's going on there. Okay. Um, so there are some study limitations. We had, a, a, unfortunately, a high withdrawal rate. About 19% of our patients did not complete the study. And um, the study was only, again, looking at that mild visual field loss and a modest improvement in their um, visual fields. So, so I think with that, we know that acetazolamide is well-tolerated safe. So combined with weight loss, it's a great option for our milder patients. Um, however, with the patients who are more advanced, we don't know if, um, uh, and unfortunately I don't have time to go into all the surgical options, but maybe we can have another session in the future where we talk about um, possible surgical options for these patients. Um, uh, we tried to do a follow-up study to this called the surgical IIHTT, the site trial. And unfortunately, uh, we had funding for that, but unfortunately we had a lot of trouble recruiting patients. Patients did not want to be randomized to maximal medical therapy versus in intervention. So it was really hard to get patients enrolled in the study. And then unfortunately we had to, we had to terminate the study because of um, poor enrollment numbers. But I think I'll end there and I'll open it up to you know, maybe a few more questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Banik. Um, just on, on that closing note, it is so patients did not want to be randomized. So what is their preference? They want to be treated 
as you know, with the intervention or want to but they were preferring the maximal medical management. So, so the criteria were very strict. Even for screening, we did not have that many patients who were able to be, you know, who were eligible for the study, but the vast majority of them did not feel comfortable having a procedure done if perhaps a medical therapy may benefit them. That was the bottom line. So we met a lot of resistance because they were being randomized to either a VP shunt or optic nerve sheath fenestration. And oh. either procedure, they did not want to be randomized, at least um, the oh. ones that were initially screened. So it was, when you say the uh, treatment, it is uh, V patient or the fenestration. Correct. The venous um, sinus stenting was not uh, one oh. of the options for this study. Oh, okay. Um, just out of these things, yes, the estazolamide is, uh, I see as our first line of management, uh, but a good number of uh, patients who come back with the tingling side effects or the toleration issues. Would you well, consider- Can I just add something about that? Yeah. Um, so, so what I tell my patients is acetazolamide will cause tingling. Almost mm -hmm. everyone will have paresthesias from acetazole. And I tell them, if you're getting the tingling, it means that the drug is in your body and it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's working. But if I, if we preach, we pre-treat them with magnesium. And if we pre-treat them with oral magnesium oxide, 400 milligrams once or twice a day, that actually prevents the tingling. And so I think by educating them that number one, they will have the tingling. Number two, if they take the magnesium that will prevent the tingling, then they're much more likely to continue with it and they don't get frightened by the tingling. So I think it really improves compliance significantly if they're made aware ahead of time that this is normal, it's supposed to happen and there's a way you can do it, you can prevent it from happening. Right. And uh, any thoughts on the recent uh, literature of uh, glucagon like peptide? Uh, for the yes, team? yes, yes. So, um, so this was talked about, um, just we're starting to talk about this in our neuroplomology community. So um, some people, have, some patients have taken GLP-1 agonists and have significant weight loss. There's a few on the market. I'm sure many of you have probably heard about them in the news. Uh, being now approved for obesity. Um, the issue is when people take the drug, they lose a lot of weight, but when they stop the drug, it comes back. There um, is a, a trial that we're about to start in conjunction with collaborators um, across the world um, using Presendin, which is a very specific type of GLP-1 agonist. And not only does it help with weight loss, but it actually has been shown in um, in uh, animal studies to decrease CSF pressure. So this trial is, is called the EVOLVE trial, E-V-O-L-V-E. -E, and we will be a center at New York Ioneer Mount Sinai My Institution for this trial, along with several other uh, centers in the US, um, in the UK, in Australia. I don't know if Canada is involved in this study, but there's a couple of other countries as well. Singapore, I think is also involved. Uh, but basically um, we're gonna be treating these patients with um, subcutaneous injections of this um, Presendin uh, drug uh, to see if it will help with IIH. Right. And there are some, uh, going back to some general questions of uh, uh, considering the pressure, uh, the IIH is increased pressure in the brain, in the head. How does that change with the outside uh, in terms of the weather-wise, uh, winter, summer, versus any altitude variations, is this going to make any difference in these patients? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So I don't think it's ever been formally studied in terms of um, the external environment impacting intracranial pressure. I don't know of any studies done at you know different altitudes or in different weather conditions. What I can tell you is that many patients with IIH also have coexisting migraine. And there's a tremendous overlap between the pressure headaches of IIH and migraine headaches. And um, sometimes it's almost difficult to distinguish the two, but we know that migraine is very susceptible to barometric pressure changes, to um, external changes, um, uh, heat, humidity, uh, uh, hydration status, uh, perhaps even altitude. So it is a little bit hard to gauge that, you know, whether IIH or, or headaches from IIH CSF pressure uh, elevation in IIH is. Um, again, uh, susceptible to those types of environmental changes, but we know that migraine is, so. And uh, also in, in your terms, it is the, when you say maximal medical therapy, uh, what would be you are taking in terms of the diamoxidosis wise or topomax? 
So we usually start patients on Dimox 500 milligrams twice a day. That's the starting dose for adults. And we, um, we titrate them depending on how they respond with their symptoms and their visual fields and their papilledema. And in many patients, in the, in the study, that we try to titrate them up to four grams a day, but many patients do not need such a high dose. Usually the one they get to in the study, when they got to about 2.5 grams a day, which is 2,500 milligrams a day, that's basically the dose that they leveled off at and they stayed at um, in terms of tolerability and improvement in their IIH. So we, uh, again, start with 500 twice a day, and then we adjust it depending on how they do. Um, if they can't tolerate it, then I would switch them to Topamax. And um, usually we do 500, sorry, 50 milligrams at bedtime to start. And the maximum dose on that is 200 milligrams at bedtime. Or 200, uh, 100 twice a day. If you wanted to split up the dose, you could do it that way also. That's great. Um, I have a more dedicated uh, ophthalmology question. So here for you, this is... So, uh, when performing the pupillary reaction, most of the patients are okay, but I met multiple patients with a relative afferent pupillary defect uh, in cases of papilledema and IIH in the absence of other posterior segment pathologies. Is it common or something that you should be concerned about? You should absolutely be concerned. If you see a relative afferent pupillary defect, that means that that eye, that nerve is not uh, functioning as well as the other side. And so I would really um, do the, all the investigations, do the visual field tests, do the OCTs, see how the patient is doing and start treatment immediately if you're dealing with an IIH patient. So it is not normal and it's an indicator of um, visual afferent dysfunction. And again, it's, it's like a red flag, basically. If you see that there's already an RAPD there, you really need to be very aggressive with the patient. So either you know maximize the medical therapy or refer the patient for a procedure to, to manage their um, intracranial pressure. Thank you. And one more, it is the, we know it is uh, patients on the uh, contraceptive pills. Uh, it increases the risk of uh, uh, venous stenosis, but have you seen any relation with between IIH and high testosterone levels? That's really interesting. I personally don't check my uh, hormone levels routinely in my patients. So unless they come in with previous blood work, looking at testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, I wouldn't know what their testosterone level is. Um, I mean, I can tell you that uh, patients, there are many patients with IIH who also have PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and they do have hormonal abnormalities. And basically I, I treat the IIH and then I refer them back to their, um, you know, endocrinologist or maybe even gynecologist for management of their hormone issues. But uh, I don't know of any known association because I think we don't routinely check for it. We did not find any associations in the IIH T though. So that's, um, you know, we didn't find any significant aberrations in testosterone or progesterone or estrogen levels. Oh, so in that, uh, in the samples you evaluated for in those 165 patients, um, it was testosterone is also one of the hormones or? I believe so. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Cause we did, we did um, that plus cortisol as well. And we did not find anything that was, that uncovered the etiology we were hoping to, but we did not. That's great. Thank you. Uh, that's all. It's thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banner. Thank you all. Our next practitioner series webinar will be on March 30th, which is um, non-invasive findings in IAH with Andrew Kim, MD. Um, so we hope to see you guys there. And thank you so much for attending. Again, if you guys have any questions, uh, further questions, we're going to drop the email and our social media handles so you guys can follow along and feel free to reach out whenever. Thank you again for being here.